Hi again, thanks for staying with us once again here in the second day of the World Football Summit 19. Gracias a todos por estar aquí otra vez en este segundo panel que tenemos en el segundo día del World Football Summit 2019 aquí en Madrid. Before going on and before moving on, I want to remind you all to download our app here at the World Football Summit in which you can find any kind of updates or you can find the time and the schedule of the, of the day and even you can connect with some other people uh, attending here to this World uh, Football Summit in order to get any kind of meetings. Recordamos además la, la posibilidad de que os bajéis también la app de, del World Football Summit para que sepáis y para que estéis al día de cualquier tipo de, de actualización de los timings, de los paneles, ya no solo en este eh, escenario principal, sino también en el resto de en los otros dos escenarios principales que también tenemos alrededor del día de hoy. And the next one, the next panel is going to be based on the power of football to engage with a global audience because uh, to remain significant, brands and right holders are facing the challenge of connecting with diverse fans in a highly saturated market and we want to show the power of football in this kind of issues. Queremos en este siguiente panel demostrar el, el poder del fútbol para, para interactuar con las audiencias globales y demostrar que toda aquella empresa que, que quiere tener una buena, un buen posicionamiento, eh, demostrar un poco cuál es el link que tiene con el fútbol y la fuerza incluso del fútbol para posicionar mejor las marcas. Y para eso, that's why we're going to welcome right now Ray de Luis Baez, Cristina Burzaco, David Hopkinson, Rita Luis y Elko van der Nol. A big applause for them, please. So, right then, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, buenos dias, good morning. Uh, thank you for being uh, with us today. I'll I introduce uh, the panelists of, uh, of, of this morning, and uh, I'll want you to uh, receive them in a great round of applause because they are leaders in their, in their fields and their, and their companies as well. So please welcome Cristina Bursaco, Brand and Communications Director of Telefónica España, Mr. David Hopkinson, Global Head of Partnerships at Real Madrid, Ms. Rita Liu, uh, Sports Marketing, Global Mar Branding and Marketing at Alipay, and uh, Ilko van der Nol, uh, Head of Partnerships at uh, Anheuser-Busch in BEV. Um, to, to kind of set up the tone of what we are discussing today, uh, this is the World Football Summit, and even though it's a, it's a, it's a football center uh, event, what we are uh, looking at is the, the potential or the strength of football as a global platform. And to give context, uh, it is estimated that uh, football reaches half of the global population, which is amazingly outstanding. I'm a basketball guy, so I, it's something that I will aspire to. Uh, so it's, that's roughly 3.5 billion people that reaches or consumes uh, football content globally. But when you zoom into specific regions, and talking about Europe, when you talk about, uh, you talk about uh, the EU5 countries, so, so Spain, Italy, France, Germany, and the UK, that's 60% of the population. So it's outstanding. But on the contrary, everything is relative. So in terms of uh, topics that interest people globally, in terms of leisure entertainment, sports in general just comes seventh behind music, cinema, health and lifestyle, and so on. So uh, what, what we are trying to approach here is and an, an, an looking at the, the potential and the strength of football is that like in any passion-driven phenomena. The big question, and actually to start the round, will be how you make yourself relevant as a brand, as a, as a sports brand, uh, how you make yourself relevant without all that, all that noise. So you are reaching massive amounts of people, and you are uh, actually you know, competing for mind, uh, mind space about, uh, around people's mind, right? So. Uh, Christine, if you might ask, uh, if you might uh, enlighten the, the audience in terms of how you think through football you can reach uh, with a clear message uh, the, the audience. 
Yeah, well, it's a very good question. There's a lot of noise out there. Uh, we as Movistar, we are like a, a pretty par particular animal because we provide connectivity and tech services inside and outside the houses. We also become technological partner to do transformation, for instance, with Real Madrid, with the new Bernabeu, as well as we do like TV entertainment and we are actually broadcasters. So overall, football for us is very important. It's very important because it's the number one content driving weekly consumptions uh, for us. But it's true that we need to, first of all, get, you know, uh, differentiation out of football because all the platforms have football as well and also we need to really you know uh, have a broader services because people don't come to us only because of football the differentiation we get on football is basically based on four or five points one thing is uh, for Movistar is content. Content is absolutely key. We are talking about these days. I mean, video is actually the, the, ver the first thing. We need to really give consumers a voice. We really make to have like, great, excellent content 24-7 on social and on pay TV. So basically, you know, driving excellent content is one of the things that can engage the user the most. The second thing would be experiences. Experiences like memorable and shareable experiences experiences that are unique to the user and that they cannot really get somewhere else. So that's actually one of the things. The other day I was reading that you know, marketers shouldn't be obsessed about the share of wallet, but the share of experience uh, rather than that. Right? Um, the third thing is that we shouldn't, uh, and that's the, the way we try to approach, uh, I mean, it's true that the football community is huge, but within that huge community, there are multiple and thousands of sub-tribes, local tribes, each of the teams. So we really need to get connection locally, understanding you know, their language and their insights, their touch points, and really go beyond this one tribe because there are multiple tribes over there. And the other thing we, we also do is trying to, as you said, there are all the disciplines that are more important in sports for the user, trying to go like cross entertainment, trying to mix e-sports with football, trying to mix in drama with football, trying to go beyond the obvious. Well, David, if, if you might pick up on, on that specific uh approach to a, a specific tribe. I mean, you represent one of the biggest specific tribes there is in world football, right? right. So how, how you approach that from the property perspective? Well, I, I think that Christina said it really well, that that word tribalism is really important. And, and, you know, my perspective, I'm a team sports person. I've always been a team sport person. And the teams have a unique opportunity to, to organize a tribe around a common set of values, a common brand, uh, this, and, and, and a journey of storytelling where a team is up, a team is down, you're in constant anticipation of what's in the future, you're in constant reflection on how you've got there and some of those historical moments. So we need partners, uh, technology partners, like, like our partner Telefonica, to not only distribute our matches, but also to, to be a platform for, to help us tell stories. And as we, we think about content uh, uh, every single day, as I think every club in the world does and every club's partner does, I think that what we need to do is a couple of things. Um, one, to make sure, I was having a good conversation with this last night, that we are telling good stories and that we're not conflating uh, coverage and content into the same thing. Like, coverage is important. And what, what we do to prepare for tonight's match, the, the build-up, the coverage of the match, the post-analysis, that's great. That's great coverage. But the, these humans love stories, and we connect to stories. So I think the uh, onus is on ourselves and on, and on every club to make sure that we're constantly telling good stories and authentic stories to a broad audience. That's, I think, the best way for us to grow our relevance. Is the match is going to be the match, but the drama around everything, the families, the players, the, the uh, heartbreak, the ambition, that's what draws people in and, and that's what they connect to. Rita, uh, following on in, in that sense, if, if you have a, and, and you just recently struck a deal with, with UEFA for, for different uh, uh, competitions in a, in a number of years, 
once the property proposed the creation of a specific platform, uh, probably a ton of boys drive, uh, driven through, through a certain uh, piece of content, how, how the brand needs to craft their own corporate message to actually uh, convey that. Uh, Rita, if you may. Sorry, uh, yeah. is that a question for me? Um, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, I cannot really hear it very So uh, the question is uh, how a, a brand like Alipay should craft their own corporate message to actually make it live together with that storyline through football? Uh, okay, yeah, so first of all, um, the storyline of football completely you know, matches with the, what Alipay, the story of Alipay. So football is a very inclusive sport. Um, and it's in line with Alipay's vision of bringing financial inclusiveness to the world, uh, or more financial inclusiveness to the world. So um, uh, to us, uh, the storyline completely matches. And also, uh, as we our business go goes global. Uh, football is a sport you know, loved by billions. It's a global platform, so it helps us uh, to drive you know, global brand awareness as well. Um, but more importantly uh, is um, there's a huge potential of football as a sport to our home market. So Alipay serves 1.2 billion users uh, with our local partners in China and Asia. And we aim to, you know, leveraging this partnership with UEFA to bring the passion and happiness of football to more people in that part of the world. Uh, and also to create more digital innovation to our users, uh, who most of them are already football fans. Yeah. So shifting a bit gears in, and this is something that uh, probably us, us sponsorship sellers uh, often kind of don't look at, but when brands enter into the space of sponsorship or sports in general, culture, you name it, uh, they are trying to achieve certain corporate objectives, which are business objectives. So my, my question is to, to, to Ilko, which uh, you represent one of the historical brands that is involved in sports. We know about the US and now your, your global football uh, approach here in, 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 in Europe. It's how, uh, how, how you set up that structure in which your dashboard looks at the way you need to do marketing to sport compared to the business objectives that you know, sales or, or brand awareness that, that the company has. How, how you, from the experience or sports marketing perspective, you, you try to achieve that? Yeah, it, it, it's a mix of elements, I guess. Uh, you know, my, my, one of my favorite quotes is, is that it's never been uh, easier to connect to people these days. It's never been more difficult to connect with people uh, these days. And I think that's very true, right? We, we have these wonderful tools in social media and other, other digital channels. And again, it's never been easier to, to connect to them, but how do you connect with them? And uh, sports in general, and football in particular, uh, really gives an opportunity to tap into the passion points of consumers. And uh, I have the privilege to work for a beer company, and you know, uh, beer is known for hundreds of years, longer than football has been around, to bring people together. Um, so with our flagship brand, global flagship brand, Budweiser, uh, we're involved, as you know, in many football platforms, most notably the World Cup, more recently the League and the Premier League, and some other, pro other properties around the world. And what we're trying to achieve is just um, the, the, pa the passion that consumers have for football. Um, we just want to sort of enhance that experience, uh, you know, while they're enjoying one of our products. Um, and, um, you know, too long in, in, in the advertising industry in, in general, and sponsorships in particular, we have been sort of interrupting those, those, those fans, right? Like, like, this is what we want to tell you. This is, this is what you want to hear. And now we want to, you know, enhance their experience. We want to entertain them. And ultimately, we want to create experiences, uh, turn experiences into content, and content into experiences. Another one of my favorite quotes. And, um, and that's what we're trying to do with the Liga, the Premier League, uh, even though we just recently started, and uh, the World Cup since 1986. Okay. When you look at it from, from the strategic point of view, the, like the, the property side of sports, it has roughly three, three tiers. So you have competitions basically run by governing bodies, then you have leagues, which is a different type of governing body, then you have teams, and, and then you have the players. 
So in, in that end, and, and going back to you, Elko, uh, what do you prime most in terms of which, which is the level in, into which you tap in to engage the audience? Is it players or, or, or leagues or so on? Yeah, and my answer is again a combination of all, and ideally all of them, and unfortunately even our company cannot afford that. Um, you know, the, let's face it, the true passion uh, of a fan sits with a, with, a, with a club and in some instances a player. Um, we have involvements with, mostly with leagues and competitions, and uh, there's a reason for that, because you know, that, is, that has a global reach. Clubs have a global reach, Real Madrid has a global reach. But there are also, you know, there are pros and cons like everything, right? It, it could be polarizing um, uh, when you're involved with a club. Clubs goes ups and down. Uh, competitions and events are always there. But, you know, you are not a fan of the World Cup. You are a fan of the country that you support. You're not a fan of the NFL. You're a fan of the Giants or the Patriots. Um, and some instances of that particular uh, football or soccer player. Uh, so it's a combination of, of all. And, um, you know, um, we, we have chosen to, to focus more on, on competitions and events um, for some of the reasons I just mentioned. But it, it's a combination, I think. Uh, and, and David, I want to, to, to pick your brains in, in, that, in that sense. From the club's perspective, and, and you've been with other successful properties as well in the in, in Americas, what a club brings that is differential from players or competitions governing bodies? Sure. I, I think Ilko said that really well. This, this is an ecosystem. And there's three parts. They've got the organizing governing bodies, whether that's La Liga, or the UEFA, the NBA. You've got the players who are the magic that makes the whole engine run, but then you've got the clubs. So I, I think Ilko's right. You, you tend to not fall in love with the league. You tend to fall in love with players who you really connect to, really gravitate to, and clubs because you do that over time. Uh, in a 117-year-old club like Real Madrid, we've had iconic athletes, beloved athletes, come through, capture the imagination, capture the hearts of millions or billions, and then retire and make way for a next generation of athletes. So I think people are always going to connect to the athletes, but over time, over generations, it's the clubs that offer a really unique um, opportunity to persist and a, a, a really strong opportunity for that brand to organize those tribes around, you know, you, I might love one player more than you love uh, that player, but we love the player in the same team, now we're in the same tribe. So that's, that's where our place in the ecosystem, and, and it's my favorite place in that ecosystem. To, to kind of hone, hone in on that, uh, do, you, do you think that the consistency of the engagement opportunity is probably the most important thing that you can offer a, a brand to, go, to achieve its business uh, opportunities because you know business is, is ongoing. Well, I think I think consistency is not our current objective. Uh, this is a world that's changing very very rapidly and getting much much smaller. Uh, if you're a fan now, you know you used to be a fan of your local team because that's what you did. You know that was just the tradition. Now you can be a fan of, of the New England Patriots if you live in Beijing. You can be a fan of Real Madrid if you live in Miami, right? This is a, 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 the world's changed very dramatically in the impact of digital. I think what we need to do is take advantage of digital opportunities to both uh, broaden our definition of, of fan. This is not, uh, you know, in, in our case, this is not simply a, a Madrid club or, or a Spanish opportunity. This is a truly global opportunity to think about that, but also to think about those fans in Miami, Beijing, wherever, as importantly as we do other fans. And that means we need to start building relationships. I think this is, the, you'll call your point about whether are we connecting with them or are we, are, are we connecting to them? Uh, or I should say the reverse, are we able to connect to them digitally or really connecting with them? And for us, that's going to mean ultimately personalization. You know, digital right now, for a lot of sports clubs, it's just another broadcast channel. We're sort of yep. treating every fan pretty much the same. 
and serving them content on a platform that's maybe not a 50-inch TV and maybe it's a five-inch screen, but we're, sell- we're, we're connecting to them in, in basically what's an, an old-school fashion of broadcast. I think ultimately if we can start to personalize those experiences, personalize those relationships using digital opportunities, we can get a whole new altitude. Definitely. Um, and Christina, going back to, to your initial remark of that duality that Telefonica has, you know, as, as a brand with a, a USP that has a specific tone of voice that wants to achieve certain objectives uh, from the business side and a content container, a premium content container. How, how do you balance that and where's the line in which you approach the whole uh, setup that you have going on? I mean, I think David, I mean, mentioned it in a, in a very, you know, in the right way. Everything is content, everything is experience, everything like is personalized to the fan user. The differences and the barriers we, uh, that we used to have in the past, that this is a sponsoring or this is football rights or this is broadcasting, I mean, they are gone. I mean, the days in which the sponsoring contract were pretty much focused on having a big log on a T-shirt or a big log on the screen, it's over now. Or even the, the, the times with the, with the, with the football rights uh, contracts only, you know, focused on having the rights and putting in a broadcast and putting in a big screen for the users, it's gone. I mean, what we believe is that either it's a sponsoring contract or whether it's a um, football rights contract, or whether it's a co market with a different brand, uh, they'll all have one same thing in common, which is partnerships. Partnerships for us is the right term. And partnerships, you could do it you know, as big or as small as you right. can, depending on the persons you put in the table, depending on the mindset. And every time we say, you know, the best thing about a contract is to sign it up, store it in a locker, and then start it from scratch with the partner itself and make it as big as possible. So having like a, a very ambitious mindset. So at the end of the day, you know, every sort of uh, c- marketing disciplines that in the past used to be very separated, they are all the same now. It's all about the user, it's all about the experience, it's all about the content, and it's all about the personalization that David mentioned. And again, in terms of the B2B relationships, it's partnerships and make it big. You need to really make it big. We do it with La Liga, we do it with Real Madrid, but we do it also with Netflix at the end of the day. And you really need to make the most out of it. So it's not complementary, it's not uh, contradictory, it's not only complementary, but it's all the same. Okay. Actually, to that point, and and this probably David will will agree with me, not too long ago, us sponsorship sellers that we now call ourselves partnerships enablers, uh, we used to think that the uh, migration or, 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 or the pool that pay TV was having on, on, on media rights that were you know, skyrocketing and still are, uh, actually worked uh, the other way around for sponsorship value because it deflated because of the exposure. But to your point, I mean, we are past that era. So I, I want to, to, to hear your take on, on, on that assert, uh, that, that uh, affirmation that kind of, you know, uh, or, on a more restrictive uh, distribution, let's say, even it has value for the property because of, of the premium value of it, it kind of deflates or goes against the marketing uh, approach or necessity of, of brands. But probably you could take uh, a couple of minutes to actually yeah. give, give us our, your thoughts in that. I mean, my opinion, I mean, it's, it's a funny question because actually when the, the revenues for the football rights increase, at the end of the day, the revenues for the football team increase as well. Maybe not in the same budget line of sponsoring, but at the end of the day, you know, those revenues go to the same teams as well, right? But um, it's true that at the end of the day, David mentioned it before, you know, what's the difference be having, be ha- uh, behind having a content on a screen, on broadcasting versus having on social on Twitter? I mean, what's the difference on that? So at the end of the day, you know, my approach is be, you know, let's think about partnership, let's build from scratch and make th- good things, but let's not confront the two things. Would you agree? Sure. Uh, I'm a big fan of television. And uh, there's, we've read lots of 
stories about the death of television and, and te television's going away. Television's not going anyway. Television's going to change. Because from the, the end user experience, it's about a screen. And whether that match is coming to you and, and your home on a 50 inch screen, whether that's coming through over the air, originally cable, or now it's coming on IPTV, the end user, the end user experience, they don't care, right? This is, that's, that's just technology. The experience is what's important. Um, there's going to be a constant tension between, I mean, these are big businesses now, and there's going to be a tension between someone who's going to offer you a check to restrict your distribution to their platform, um, and there's going to be someone that offers you another check to offer you distribution on a broader platform. Uh, I don't think there's a right answer or a wrong answer. I think every decision is going to be made on a on an organization by organization basis, on a club by club basis, depending on that club situation at that time. So I don't think there's a clear right or wrong. I acknowledge there's a tension there, and uh, we will see how the world evolves. My, my bias is to, my personal bias is to broad distribution because that's how you build a business that is um, sustain, most, most effectively sustainable over the long term. Yeah, definitely. Um, Rita, uh, going to you, uh, uh, when you look at the financial services uh, and payment category as, as a broad category, it, it, you don't see that many players. You see like two behemoths that kind of dominate the space and so on, but Alipay comes to, to fill a void or be in the middle of, of those uh, companies uh, which are you know, the, the transactions uh, providers or uh, their, their financial payments providers and their bank partners and the merchants and the users. Um, what is your take or what is the belief of that football can help you cut through and position Alipay as, uh, as, as a preferred option for fans to actually engage in, 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 with your company and with your services? Um, yeah, so, so first of all, Alipay is new. It's new in, in sports or in sports sponsorship. Uh, but like I said in, in the beginning, uh, football uh, is a very inclusive sport uh, as we see it. And so it, we share the same vision. And that's why also you know, besides the UEFA partnership, we are also uh, supporting uh, Chinese women's football team. Um, um, and so, so on, on, on that, uh, is, I think is the first driver why we uh, chose to partner, uh, why we chose to start this journey of sports uh, uh, sponsorship or sports partnership. Um, and also, like, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, that uh, among our 1.2 billion users in China and Asia, most of them are already football fans. And we see there are lots of uh, uh, aspects we can use our technology to drive digital innovation and also as this topic is about engaging with global audience I think you know um, David mentioned the personalization I think you know uh, whatever service when it goes global you really um, uh, what's important is uh, the, uh, the 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 um, how to engage with the local users the way they like it so, for example, in China, uh, people are so used to do everything on mobile, right? Like with Alipay, they can buy movie tickets, they can pay for utility bills, they can manage their, their money, they can borrow money, everything on Alipay. So we, uh, we see that there are actually many ways to engage with Chinese audience better uh, through our platform and, um, and how to say, it, like um, make the experience better for Chinese uh, users with our platform. So, um, yeah. yeah. Well, go, going a bit deeper into that, coming from a completely foreign industry to what we normally face in sports, what, what is your take on the current digital transformation of football in particular or sports in general? Right. <laughs> is, is it there much more to do? Yeah. I, I think I have no authority to talk about sports uh, too much, but I think you know, how technology is changing our lives uh, is the same in many aspects. Uh, as we all know, you know, uh, the disruptive technologies that are driving force industrial revolution, right, uh, including 
IoT, blockchain, A AI, VR. Um, it's happening in every aspect of our lives, and including sports. Um, so actually, how we, how we pursue our endeav ende endeavor to drive financial inclusion is also through our technologies. Uh, we call it BASIC, uh, that being blockchain, AI, security, uh, IoT, and uh, cloud computing. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, we see that uh, these technologies are, uh, are being used in sports, right? Like, you know, VR is being used to improve uh, 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 viewing experience. IoT and cloud computing are used to uh, enhance, you know, like uh, connectivity in stadiums and equipment. Um, all of these are happening. Um, and... Um, so, uh, does that answer your question? Uh, oh, it kind of does. Yeah, and uh, do I need to give a, uh, an example of how, what we are doing uh, with this partnership? I'll, I'll be remiss if I don't ask you if we can expect something groundbreaking with, through your partnership with UEFA for the Euro 2020, which part of the group stage will be played here in Spain, in, in, in Bilbao. Can, can we expect something uh, new out of that Alipay partnership that goes into the stadiums and how fans will experience the event? Yeah, so um, uh, just to give you an example, in June we launched with UEFA a project uh, of uh, uh, UEFA's mini program on Alipay's platform. So uh, it's the first time UEFA sells, uh, you know, uh, uses a digital ticketing solution outside of UEFA.com. Um, and so basically it's a light app within Alipay, the main app. So that's, it's based on our open platform concept. So anyone can build a light app within our main app interface without the hassle of users having to download another app. Um, and so the, 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 the Chinese users can, exp can buy the tickets within uh, environment where they are very familiar with. Uh, so it was uh, very well received by, by, by Chinese fans. Um, and we are looking to do more of that uh, in the future with uh, our partnership with UEFA. Right. Yeah. Very tough. Uh, Ilko, beer, contrary to financial services, is more tricky uh, category, uh, not because we don't love beer, but because each market has its own ground rules. And especially here in Europe, we, you know, we like that uh, dichotomy of regulation, let's say. Um, but uh, you, you, through years, we've been saying that sports per se was the, the biggest social network. It, it kind of congregates people. Uh, some people say that beer is the glue that, you know, ties them together. <laughs> so, uh, in, in terms of the marketing enablers of football, uh, and specifically in your revamped uh, activity with the Premier League and now the new partnership with, with La Liga, uh, what are the specific topics from the marketing perspective that, that you are after uh, through those partnerships? You're asking what are the specific topics that we're after? It's, it's yeah, the, the, the specific marketing uh, uh, enablers or objectives through those two partnerships in concrete, in, in terms of, uh, of that gregarious nature of, of beer and, and how it plays with sports and entertainment. Yeah. Um, look, at the end of the day, we want to we wanna, uh, develop brand preference. You know, by, by basically associating ourselves and working together with some of the properties you just mentioned, uh, in the end of the day, what we are trying to do is to enhance the fans' experience um, and uh, by that hopefully create brand, uh, uh, you know, um, contribute to our brand attributes, what in this case Budweiser stands for, high energy, bringing people together, you just mentioned it, your original social network of bringing people together. And if done responsibly, and I emphasize that because our company, and I'm not just offering you lip service here, um, you know, uh, is paying an enormous amount of attention and resources on responsible drinking. And we believe uh, with sports, entertainment, music, football in particular, uh, if consumed responsibly, it enhances the, the experience, right? Uh, you talk about football, not over a glass of water here, but we're gonna talk about over a glass of beer. Let's have a beer tonight and talk about Real Madrid, right? So if done responsibly, uh, it adds and enhances the uh, experience. So at the end of the day, 
uh, we want to uh, rub off the, the, the positive feeling that people have, the passion they have for, for their club, their player, their league, what have you, uh, that then adds to our brand values, brand attributes, and ultimately that has to translate into brand preference uh, and considerations for our brand. Okay. Well, we'll have a, a last question for, for, uh, for all of you uh, to wrap up, and, and, and it's something that has been uh, in the minds of many in the, in the industry, uh, and it's somewhat related to governance. Uh, the sponsor, so the property, the player, or the league, uh, is the caretaker of the relationship with the audience, which in the end is the brand's client. The question is simple. Uh, in nowadays, in which uh, we need to, to, to caress that relationship, should brands, companies that partner with sports entities have a saying or a seat at the, at, at the table in terms of governance or kind of a, from an advisory perspective or, or having a voice to make us you know, all honest and be sure that that relationship with your customers in the end is being taken care of in a proper manner? What, what is your take on that, Christina? Well, in my opinion, I mean, sometimes, I mean, the brands have a say in a more direct way and sometimes in a more indirect way. But at the end of the day, it's a part of ecosystem. It's a very complex and rich ecosystem with brands, with broadcasters, with TV owners, uh, right owners. And at the end of the day, all the decisions we are making in those partnerships that we were saying before, at the end of the day, it's, as I say, in this ecosystem, how it evolves. David? So, no. I don't think uh, brands should. Uh, but let me expand on that. The most important thing in a partnership is trust. And we've got to trust one another in a partnership. So I, I think sometimes we can get very focused on uh, how much the check was and maybe what the inventory is going to be. I think there's a whole process that happens before that, which is we've got to pick our partners in life very carefully. <laughs> Not only our, our, our partners in our personal lives, but our partners in, in our business lives. The, the, only, the only people that can ever really hurt you are your partners. So you want to pick your partners very, very carefully. But then you've got to trust that partner to go do their job effectively. Uh, for clubs like ours, you can see that we've done that effectively over a very long period of time, and I think that that builds reputation, that the, the, the trust is well established, that's real character. I think our partners need to let us go do our job and trust us to do our job well the way we trust them to go do their job well. You know, we wouldn't go tour one of Telefonica's plants and see that everything's going well there. We wouldn't go tour Audi's. Uh, facilities and say, hey, what about this with the car? We're trusting them to go do their job well and we expect that back. Rita? Can we go first? Okay. No, I, I think, look, um, they run a club. Uh, FIFA runs its organization. UEFA runs its organization. Uh, you know, leagues run their organizations and that's what they're doing for a living, right? Uh, clubs want to win off and on the pitch. We want to sell beer. I think as long as there's a healthy dialogue and the club or a, con a federation or a league is open to the uh, suggestions that, uh, that accommodate our business requirements, I think it's all needed. I don't think it has to be formalized in terms of committees and all that stuff. Like, for instance, we have an excellent relationship with La Liga here, Premier League in England and, and FIFA and they are very, very open to our suggestions. There are limitations, either from rights perspective or, or other reasons, uh, but the experience that we have is that with, with most, if not all of the partners in the world of sports and in football in particular, um, you know, we have a lot to offer as well, right? We, we, you know, I'm working for a publicly traded company and we have a lot of knowledge and, and clubs, leagues and, uh, uh, and others that we're engaged with, they're very open-minded to listen to our suggestion in some instance you know, uh, implement them or they can help us. So it's a dialogue. I don't think it has to be formalized. I don't know how to run a club. That's what they do. I know how to sell beer. And together, I think, uh, you know, we can do good things. Yeah, I think for us, you know, we just started the partnership with UEFA since last November, so it's new. It's uh, we're just starting the journey, uh, but we see this as a partnership. Uh, you know, the projects we, 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 we I just mentioned, it's not something that's mentioned in the contract. It's a it's a it's a co-creation of how you know we can uh, you know build uh, you know 
better engagement with our users and their users, and so we can bring the happiness or passion in football to more people. So it's really, um, I think, you know, uh, it's really a partnership for us. Uh, not the uh, sponsorship, it's more a partnership that, you know, like I, actually I see a uh, huge potential of how we can actually help, uh, you know, football to reach more people uh, in our part of the world and also uh, uh, enhance the experience. So uh, I think uh, we're very excited, uh, you know, like uh, the co-creation journey we'll have with UEFA. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, ladies thank and you. gentlemen. Uh, Please give a round of applause to Christina, David, Rita, and Ilko. Thank you. Thank you. No? Thank you very much. It's been a great panel. Thanks to all of you. In five minute break, we'll be right back here with the future of women's football right after the World Cup held in France this summer. En cinco minutos volvemos aquí en este escenario principal para hablar del futuro y también del presente del fútbol femenino después de la Copa del Mundo de Francia. Five minute break, and we'll be right back. En cinco minutos nos vemos. Gracias.